So today, you know that I love to tell you about some of the bad, and I love to tell you my opinions, you know, which I don't very well hold back on the status of women and the lack of it um, in many areas and celebrate some of our accomplishments. But that's not my task today. My task today is to bring you into the world of the practical, all right, to figure out how you individually can use your power to move this agenda forward. Because if you look around this room, there is nobody seated here because this is by invitation for a purpose. You are seated here for a reason. Our friend Linda didn't send out an invitation to everybody she knew. She didn't even send out an invitation to everybody who was, on, who was fighting this fight. She sent out an invitation to those women who would take the power that they have and use it to advance women. And in this case, as, as Bobby said, one of the directions that we have right now at the ABA is closing the gap, is, is figuring out the specific ways for us to get gender equity wherever we work, and then with that power, to figure out how to give it to the women who are coming forward who don't recognize that they don't have it. But most importantly, women in law using their power to advance women in law who in turn will be able to protect the women of the United States and beyond. And I don't know how many of you were reading the news, but G8 has just accepted the fact that rape is an act of war. And that I, why we have to fight for that one, I don't get either. But in any case, I will say that just a few days ago, G8 has come forward with that. That means we again have another international fight to be talking about rape as a weapon. All right, and, um, and unfortunately, rape is a weapon here as well in many other circumstances. And thank you, Bobby, for talking about the trafficking initiative, which we will not be spending time on today. But I need to tell you, all right, that this is a huge priority, that we have 100,000 US citizens in slavery in this country, your country. Not to count the tens of thousands of men, women, and children that are brought across the border into sex and labor slavery in your country today. So I want to have an opportunity to speak to you about everything that's happening here. But when you start reading what's in the newspaper finally as part of a national awareness campaign that the ABA and others are running, when you read about it, don't think this doesn't happen in Chicago where I live. Don't think for a second it's not in Kansas City. Don't think for a second, because by the way, the hubs initially were Seattle and Atlanta, and now Chicago, and New York. But every small town in between, because this horror is so pervasive, so pervasive. So let's switch to some good news, gender inequity. <laughs> <laughs> because I know we can solve this one. I know we can. We know that visibility does not equal equality. That makes it worse for us, in a sense, when we fight this fight. Because when we speak to our younger generation, to our male partners, to our women partners, to the compensation committees, to the, those who have the power to change the way compensation is addressed in law firms, when we speak to them, they look around the room and they say, my goodness, you're everywhere. You are the face of the legal profession. Where, in fact, when most of us started to practice laws, I look around the room. You were the only woman walking into a courtroom. You're the only woman at an M&A table. You were still being asked you know, to pour the coffee. But today, just because there are a lot of women around doesn't mean that we're being treated equally. And I know that Judge Gerstner spoke yesterday on the numbers. So while we're here, let's talk about how we can change this reality. The APA's Gender Equity Task Force, which is chaired this year by Bobby Liebenberg, and the Commission on Women at the American Bar Association put a lot of thought into this question. To begin, we focused our efforts at the partner level, because change must come from the top. So we created a gender equity toolkit. I, somebody told me that not only do you have the brochures at your table, but you have the toolkits in the back, in the corner. This beautiful package is beautiful in more than one way. 
It's beautiful because it's specific. It's beautiful because it gives a flash drive. It's beautiful because this small packet, if put in the hands of every state and local bar association, of every woman's bar association, of every woman lawyer partner with power, will in one year change the universe for women. You're looking at a cure. And the reason is because we're taking gender equity partner compensation apart. And we are giving a, the agenda, the reading materials, the discussion topics, nothing, the speakers bureau, nothing you would lack if you would like to run a big conference or a small, or simply have a conversation with managing partners of a firm or the women senior partners of a firm. And it's suggesting, of course, that this conversation isn't with women. It's with women and men who have the ability to change the compensation practices in a law firm. Conference in a box is what Bobby calls this. And it's pretty extraordinary. And the woman sitting next to Bobby, Sean Kaminsky, who is director of the Commission on Women at the ABA, is an extraordinary soul as well. And she, Brooks, no knows and made this happen. Now, we focused at the partner level. We created the toolkit. It will help leaders of bar associations across the country to start a dialogue about fairness because it also gives you a choice of tones. You can talk in matter of fact, facts. You can speak in quiet, what can we do together to get this our firm that we love into the top of the list of those firms that women want to go and stay at. You can speak about attrition. You can speak about retention, which are the real big issues in every firm in this country right now, small and large. Because if you find the key to preventing attrition and retain your lawyers, two things will happen that are quite obvious. But for some reason, they're not happening. The women who the firm is spending hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars on will understand that they need to stay in the practice of law at all costs. We will, we will convey a message that they are welcome because we will figure out a way, firm by firm, to assure that they remain welcome. It's not enough for the, for the partners in the firms who are men predominantly to say, I'm going to be good to these women, but what in the world can I do? Because when I need them, they're not here. We need to be demonstrating that when, we, when they need us, we are there. We are there. But the other message I think we need to be giving to our younger women, which I got hammered at the other day, Right? In a kind of big way, you can go on the ABA blog, because my sense is that we don't discuss balance. Balance to me, it doesn't exist in a, in a life that's full. Right? Balance, I lead a life that juggles, and I speak in terms of managed chaos, because that's my life. Right? I don't wake up every morning measuring myself against somebody who looks calm. Like you might see me walking around the hall smiling at you and shaking your hand and telling you how wonderful life is. And you don't have any sense of what's going on in my life at that time. But to communicate just that smooth demeanor to me is a fraud. They're very, well, just tell me, am I wrong? No. All right? No. I, 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 that doesn't mean you can't practice law, have children, and lead a dozen lives, and do wonderful things if you don't want to have children, and commit yourself to, to areas that we're advancing right now in the community. Or you have elder care, or you want a political career. Whatever it is that you want, that doesn't mean imbalance. It doesn't mean that you can't do it. I think that's part of a full life. And it's the positive message that we are not conveying, ladies. We've moved past whining. We've moved past whining. But when is the last time you greeted me in the hall and said, isn't life fabulous? I love practicing law. It's my message to you. I love what I do. I am passionate about being a lawyer. I can't imagine life without it. But we don't say that. We say, step forward, I can help you. 
I can help you with the problems. I can help you figure out a different schedule. Yes, I know it's tough, but nobody is conveying how wonderful it is to be who we are and have the opportunity both to change the world if we want, or to raise adorable children if we want, or write a book if we want, or teach negotiation skills, or be the consummate trial lawyer, or the consummate transactional lawyer, the consummate tax lawyer, or trust lawyer. And now guess what? Which is the other thing I'm telling women. What are the new areas of practice? Convey to them the spaces. Because the table is full. And it's a zero sum game in some cases. But a full table admits women when you add another chair. It's that simple. One of the chairs I'm telling women to add are the specialties that are coming forward. Did you ever think that you would live in a world where there was an expertise in space law? I'm serious. I'm laughing. All right. But I'm, but I'm serious. If a young woman today, a new lawyer today, goes to her firm and says, in addition to the assignment I'm taking for you, I want to develop an expertise in space law because right now, lawyers are negotiating the transactions of supplies and merchandising and what our space shuttles are carrying. They are right now developing the risks and disclosures that have to be made on the tickets for your ride in space and the prices for it. And the, and the insurance, and all the other issues. All right, this is totally new, is it not? <laughs> National security law, not exactly new, but unknown. You develop an expertise, or your mentee or protege develops an expertise in cyber law, or national security law, she will be the go-to partner of the future. And because so few people have this expertise, she will be the go-to partner on the compensation committee. And what did we hear yesterday? She will be on the board of directors. She will be on corporate boards of directors if she chooses. The other, which brings us back to trafficking, the expertise that is now developing, is the one certain way of eliminating slavery in our country and around the world is to wipe the profit out of it. If there's no profit, the horrors, those horrible people, the captors, they'll go back to guns and drugs. Now you know that trafficking is one of the most profitable, second most profitable crime, and it's organized crime, in the world. And the reason is, you can sell a gun once, and you sell that hit of drugs once. But I capture a human being, a nine or a 10 or an 11 year old child. I capture that little boy and I can use him and her over and over and over again, raping her 20 times a day for the rest of her life because she will never be free. If that's the case, we need to eliminate slavery from the supply chains of our corporations. And it's not that hard because our corporations, first of all, understand that they don't want to be trading in slaves. And they are already auditing all the way down the supply chain by regulation on federal corrupt practices, money laundering, and child labor. And so what we want to do is tell them, <coughs> just add a module to the consultants that they've already hired. Now it's not quite this easy and I'm not gonna talk about it at length because it's not the topic, but if you are a young woman today or a middle woman looking to bring in clients, compliance in this area is huge because any moment now, both based on the uniform law that we're putting forward, based on the California Disclosure and Transparency Act, which I'll talk about with you in the hall, your corporate clients are going to need to know how to clean their supply chains voluntarily not simply all right, by mandate. So one, new areas of practice, the passion for the practice of law, the upside of what we do, 
and somehow not being quite as understanding in this way. When lawyers come to me and say, I'm going to take five years off, and this is where I got hammered, right? When lawyers say, come to me and say, I'm taking five years off and then I'm coming back, because I'm always direct, I say, how? And they say, well, I'm just going to come back. I said, to our little firm? And the answer is, I've, I have my own retention package, you know, the way that, because it's so small I can do it, is start to just keep someone who's taken a lengthy pregnancy leave, all right, doing of counsel work for me so she's not losing the benefit. But larger firms don't have the ability to do this unless you, ladies, and there might be a gentleman here, so I'm not sure, okay? You ladies start to talk to your firms about retention of those lawyers who are going out for lengthy leaves. And one of the things that the Gender Bias Task Force and Gender Equity Task Force will be doing next year, and I actually will be ch changing places with Bobby and sharing next year the Gender Equity Task Force as Bobby becomes chair for a year of the Commission on Women, so you should know that. That's pretty fabulous. Um, we're going to be talking about <coughs> retention from a very specific standpoint, programs and CLE and education, which will be quite flexible to offer to women who are either going out and want to stay with their fingers in the practice or have been out for three years and know that in two more years or three more years they want to come back in. Because right now, raise your hand if you would hire somebody who was five years out and hadn't stepped in a courtroom or done a transaction, had no idea with what the new tax laws are or anything like that. I mean, you can raise your hand. You would hire, that's a good woman back there, right. <laughs> Guess who? Guess who? Right. <laughs> so we have to figure out strategy. We have to figure out how to keep our women in the practice so that there are people to promote. So that in 15 years, we don't have the problem we have, not for lack of gender equity, but for the certainty that our women are coming back and have been able to choose a life that either combines everything at once, for that managed chaos I adore, or focuses on family, but has a way of coming back in. And I'm not talking about mommy track here. I'm talking about educated lawyers who represent their clients. This we know we can do. So we are going to be in the toolkit, provides you with new ways to share origination credit, new ways to reward client development, new ways to recognize contributions to the firm's growth, and new systems for compensation that acknowledge diversity in a fair and transparent way. And the success of the toolkit hinges on you, the implementation of bar associations and bar leaders. That means that you're taking this toolkit to the president of your bar association, local or state, and asking them to make this a highlighted program this conference, asking them if they need to, to turn it into their diversity committee to take charge of. Again, it doesn't have to be their overall major program, or it can, and it should be, because anybody that uses this dialogue is going to set a tone that says, a can do, they did it, pointing at firms that have actually accomplished changing the place for women and the equity within the firms. So this is just a start. There are more resources that are coming from the ABA's Gender Equity Task Force. We're developing a roadmap to help law firms achieve gender equity and partner compensation. We recognize that not all firms are the same. Some are more advanced in the pay equity efforts. Some may start aggressive efforts tomorrow. But with a map towards success, we hope to encourage law firms of all sizes to adopt the suggestions in this toolkit. And then we're going to produce a booklet full of instructions for women lawyers on how to effectively negotiate compensation. Again, the specifics. Why do we have to teach lawyers how to negotiate? All right. We really don't, by the way. It's like whenever I'm giving in a negotiation workshop, I tell the women come in droves because they don't think that they know how to negotiate. Your message is 
women who I'm working with, women, you know how to negotiate. You're actually the, the best negotiators there are. But there's confidence building involved. Women need things like a lined up and say, oh, I can do that, I can do that, I did that, I did that, I did that, I did that. And an emphasis on the importance of preparation. And again, all right, communication to find the right tone with the right person and making certain that you look and sound like them when it comes to negotiation so that they think that they're negotiating with themselves. And of course, they do no wrong. And as a result of that, all right, you've been successful in your negotiation. And we're going to reach out to our general counsels all over the country. Bex practices checklist for general counsels. Organizations can ensure that women they hire receive fair compensation. Our general counsels also need to be empowered. Also need to be empowered. We don't plan to leave anything on the table. If you have thoughts, this is not the end of the remarks, but as I'm talking to you, I don't mind if you take your pencils out, if you take your Blackberries and smartphones out and start thinking about a couple of very specific ideas that your law firm or you even dreamed about or is implementing right now. And then when you get back, you can send it to Linda Chanow, to me or to Bobby, and we will incorporate them. So please, these little things, don't say, oh, that's too small, I'm embarrassed. Then don't put your name on it, right? Or don't have somebody else send the email. Right. <laughs> but the fact is nothing is too small because we are talking about the tiny now. We're talking about the tiny and the specific, and that's what we want from you. So. We are also fighting for the passage of the Paycheck Fairness Act, specifics that you can do. Now, amazingly, there are those who oppose the Paycheck Fairness Act and dispute solid data that demonstrate that women's pay is not equal to men's. They dispute that. They claim that the workplace pay for discrimination, workplace pay discrimination does not exist. I'm here to destroy a few myths for you. This isn't the advocacy part of the Paycheck Fairness Act. This is so that you are able to respond to those who are in a position to talk to our senators. And it is the senators who are considering the Paycheck Fairness Act, all right? Because the House of Representatives will be passing this yet again. And, re and relatively fast. It is your senators. And I'd like to make this a bipartisan conversation, but I cannot. It is your Republican senators. So, and that is what we have to develop, the constituency that is bipartisan. What we have failed at, I must say, is taking the easy path to talk up to the people who are like-minded and get those constituents out on the street. But we need to talk to our sisters who have strong Republican contacts. And, and, and we'll be speaking to their senators to say, I know, I know that you understand how important this is. And the response is, one, it's not true because no matter how you dress it up or turn it inside out, we women are consistently, irrefutably denied equal pay for equal work. And the statistics we are giving are correct. They do not incorporate part-time lawyers or part-time women workers. They are relating to full-time. Opponents claim that the Paycheck Fairness Act is unnecessary because it duplicates the Equal Pay Act and Fair Labor Standards Act. And what do we say to that? We say it is not true, ladies. The Paycheck Fairness Act picks up where the Equal Pay Act le left off. The act makes critical improvements and eliminates the loopholes that we have been enduring in the Equal Pay Act, which, by the way, is celebrating its 50th anniversary in June. And next, the opponents claim, and they do claim this in writing, on TV, in the halls of the Capitol, that it is other factors besides sex that contribute to unequal pay, that it's women who choose the wrong fields to study, that we choose the wrong paths to pursue, and that we don't work as hard and we don't work as long. That is what? Not true. And you need to prepare yourself to destroy these myths and stand up when somebody says, my corporation can't afford to support the, the Paycheck Fairness Act because it would mean that we'd have to pay women more. Oh, my Lord. And I hear that. 
repeatedly. It would be too costly. There will be too much litigation in retaliation if we adopt a system that allows for women and men to discuss their pay and bonuses. And so our employment policies say that we can fire you for discussing these policies. Ladies, I get it. I represent corporations. I run my own firm. I understand it. It simply means that you're not going to get sued if your pay is equal. If you are paying equally, why do you care if people talk about compensation? Because what they should be talking about is how fabulous this firm is about equality and transparency of compensation. Not about the fear that some will, will find out that pay is unequal. The argument to that is very simple. This Paycheck Fairness Act is not about instilling more litigation for plaintiff's lawyers. It's about helping corporations because if there's a policy, the woman comes forward and says, you know, I was talking to Steve who sits right next to me and we job share. So I know my pay is unequal. And the response to that is very simple. Let me look at it. Oh my goodness, it is. And I wonder how long this has been happening. If corporations really intend to pay equally, there is nothing wrong with the Paycheck Fairness Act, because that's what it's about, informing the corporations. Now, you're going to have some tough arguments about this. And this is where leaders stand up together. Not singly, so that you get batted down, but together this message has to be. No longer will women tolerate being paid differently. How many of you would tolerate? I shouldn't ask that question because I bet many of you do tolerate being paid unequally. It's either because you don't know or you don't want to make the waves, right? Because if you were to go to your practice leader and say, Stephen here and I, we brought the client in, we tried the case, we got the $500 million verdict, we collected the $500 million verdict, and our general counsel is thrilled with our work. Why is it that Peter, or Steve, or whoever this guy is, why is it that he was given the next case with that client and not me? Now, Linda's looking at me. All right, and I'm going to finish up very nicely. <laughs> All right, but what I'm saying to you is there is a part of this that uh, is a time of no excuses. We are now asking you to do the comfortable, the easy things, discussion and dialogue, and the uncomfortable. Now, I'm asking you to, to do the unpopular, but I'm not asking you to do it yourself. And the panel that we're going to have is going to be talking about taking risks and actually taking a chance on being unpopular, but finding the right tone and the group of people to surround you so that you are unquestioned in your authority to point out how a firm or a corporation can improve themselves. Because I'm truly of the belief, not necessarily a glass half full girl, in case you hadn't noticed, all right, but I'm truly of the belief that our corporations and our law firms really do want to do the right thing now. I'm speaking to managing partners on a regular basis all over this country. And when we talk about diversity, they are puzzled. They are puzzled. And we talk about some of these steps, and they are ready to implement. And we talk about setting a place at the table that doesn't exist to make sure there are women on compensation committees, even if they don't qualify by having the rainmaker status at 10 to 15 million book. They do qualify by having a perspective of the firm and what fairness is. So we know that we've got a way to go. We did a Twitter chat. And it was very successful, and we'll do another. Because that's what's geared to the young women and the young men, because this is a woman and man conversation. And then, of course, if you haven't joined the American Bar Association, you need to be doing it, because actually, we very much need your support. It is dollars. We're not rich. And these are very, very difficult programs to run. So think about doing that. But mostly, 
Moving from rhetoric to action, I want you to step up and you share origination credit with a woman. And maybe you want to let the world know about it through that woman. Let her brag about what happened. All right, step up and refer a business or a job opportunity to a woman. I know most of you are doing it, but I don't know that you're doing it every day, all day long. The hard referral is the one you have to look for. Mentor or sponsor, of course, but sponsor is much more important. Mentor is advice, she can get that anywhere now. All right, sponsor means when you're in a meeting and she's not there, you need to be talking about how fabulous she is, how she's the one to take this case on to the general counsel, to your partners. You need to be boasting for this woman. And collectively, we need to be a strong, strong force. Because as the saying goes, with great power comes great responsibility. You are here for a purpose in this room. We need to create a ripple effect. And I want you to go on AmericanBar.com org slash gender equity. And as we are transitioning to our panel, I want you to take your smartphones out. And I want you right now to go on AmericanBar.org slash gender equity. And if you can't get on for some reason, I want you to write it on the very, very first page of the program that you're going to take home today. Because on AmericanBar.org right now, we are running a virtual march. I asked when I was, became president of the ABA, and it's true, uh, there are women who have come before me, but they have not made gender equity the be all, be all goal for the ABA. This is gender equity. It's about white women and women of color. Our women of color sisters are suffering much more than we are. The double bind is huge. And we talk about it all the time, but we're not doing anything about it, truly. So when you're out there looking where to give your origination credit, when you're out there looking for the next case, this a woman of color is the person you should be going to first with that opportunity. AmericanBar.org gender equity is the equivalent of my request for a five million person march on Washington. I wanted it. I actually think that we should be doing it. Because the one thing I want to leave you with right now, as far as things to do, is to be noisier. I haven't heard anything, except when Bobby's talking and a couple of our, you know, our, the fabulous women here. And certainly Michelle Mays has never been quiet in her life. All right. <laughs> but Michelle and I sit down and we say, who are the other women who are out there talking about inequity? And they really are a handful. Nancy last night, absolutely fabulous. But we're talking to ourselves like in this group. We aren't saying that we have lost patience, it's the end and we're done. As if we were negotiating a deal and it was everything, it was a bet the company deal. My friends, ladies, lawyers, this is the bet the company deal. You have the responsibility to stand up and speak out. Shy doesn't cut it anymore. And you have the responsibility to go home and tell your women friends that they're going to have to stand up right alongside you, not behind you hiding. Alongside you is a force because we have the numbers and we have the talent and we have the smarts. Why in the world can't we change this world right now with that combination? If the women of Ireland settled the Northern Ireland problem, it was the women. We can certainly do something about equal pay and equity in this world right now. AmericanBar.org slash gender equity. All you're doing is clicking your heels to march to Washington, and you're sending out to every human being you know, just not your little list, every human being that you know, anywhere on the planet, man, woman, or child. And I want your children clicking and sending it out to their network, because I want to have, I would love to have five million, but if we had a million clicks marching to Washington and on behalf of equal pay and equity for women, you bet somebody would start paying attention. Because the next time we do that, we're going to ask for a dollar a click. And the next time, maybe five dollars a click. And won't it be interesting to see what senators and congresspeople will not recognize the force that we are. Ladies, 
no excuses. I love you all. Thank you for this opportunity.